episode 180 above ground podcast walking the path with kim eagle disclaimer the hosts of this podcast will foley and tpp are not medical professionals and this is not medical advice both will and tpp have firsthand experience with mental illness they have their own perspective and own thoughts on mental health challenges above ground podcast was birthed to help those who struggle with their mental health through honest dialogue By speaking openly and sharing tools, they foster connection. By fostering connection, they convey hope. With connection and hope, we can continue to increase awareness. These conversations aim to break down the walls while building stronger foundations for positive mental health. This is Above Ground Podcast. Coming at you live with real conversations about mental health from the peer perspective, it's time for Above Ground Podcast. Now your hosts, TPP and Will Foley. Hey, what is up everyone? Welcome to Above Ground Podcast. Above Ground Podcast, because you can't serve below. Episode 180. It is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. It is officially Thanksgiving Eve of 2022. A happy Thanksgiving to everyone out there. There's always something to be grateful for, no matter how dark it looks on the other side, okay? And I'm grateful that I've been able to do what I've been able to do this year, and um, I'm still here to talk about it, so that's all I can say about that. Uh, Another thing we're grateful for is we're grateful for Upstate Punk Rock Fleet Market. Upstate Punk Rock Fleet Market, December 18th at Empire Live in downtown Albany. Mike Langone from Black Belt Jones and uh, Sweet Things and Dead Ends, man. I, awesome art, bone art. It's great. I think it's such a cool like connection to life. It's just a, a perfect life cycle, if you ask me. But I'm a little different like that. Anyway, so uh, episode 180, we have Ms. Kim Eagle. Uh, before we get to that, want to give a big shout out to Tim. Tim released his book. Never underestimate the power of you, and it is doing well. He thanks everyone for all those for all those purchases and leaving all the reviews, and I'm sure we'll be putting something up on the podcast pretty soon. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing where else it can go with it. So please pick it up at Amazon. The link is in the show notes. And I know if not, we got to put the link up on our Above Ground podcast Instagram page. So here we go, man. 180. Kim Eagle. Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to Above Ground Podcast. Above Ground Podcast? Because you can't serve below. Hell no, you can't, TPP. What's up, buddy? Good evening. Good evening, my friend. How are you? Oh, dude, come on, man. Like, we just got done talking about this, like, (laughs) weird... This weird dynamic of being in the evening and stuff. And I'm like, okay, woo, let's do it. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm just excited. We are joined this week by Kim Eagle. She is a licensed therapist who empowers and provokes change in her clients. Kim, thank you so much for being here. How are you? How is sunny San Diego, California? (laughs) Thank you, Will and Tim. And sunny San Diego is going good. It's great. It's great here. I am super happy to get into this conversation because relationships are so integral parts of our lives. And I, what we usually start off with is you telling us who you are, what you do, and why you do it. Okay, perfect. So as you said, I'm a licensed therapist and I have been doing this for over 20 years, actually, at this point, which is kind of crazy. Being adding in school and just internships and pre-licensing, um, licensed for 12. So why do I do this? You know, it was always a very natural role for me, just kind of being that person that was always just very interested in what was going on with not only just my friends, but like I wasn't the the girl that was in just one click. It was like very curious about all different types of people and what was going on with people. And so it's a, it's a very natural role for me. Um, And just to know when I kind of was thinking about what I wanted to do to just, you know, be in the understanding that, oh my gosh, this is a job. You can just be able to relate and talk to people and just get real, real with people. I, I've always really enjoyed just 
getting beneath the surface in terms of my own personal relationships and like really getting to know somebody. So um, it's just cool being able to offer that space for somebody. And I love it. I really, truly love what I do. And I think it's important to love this kind of work because you are so intimate in a space with someone and hearing, you know, it's, it's a privilege for people to disclose all things that they sometimes tell nobody in a lifetime. So I think it's, um, it's a space that I really protect and I, you know, prioritize and just think is really important. Tim and I feel very privileged that we get to have conversations with people like yourself, but mm -hmm. we've also, we've been doing this for three years. We've had conversations with people who have had multiple suicide attempts, uh, lost, mm -hmm. uh, suicide loss survivors. Uh, we've pretty much run the gamut for, for mm -hmm. conversations. So we really feel like we're the curators of hope in a way, yeah. like we feel yeah. that way. So thank you so much for the privilege of being able to talk yeah. to you. I'm really curious, like your fascination with people obviously started very early. Did you have a traumatic experience growing up? Mm. Did you have a good, or is there something that kind of brings you yeah. to this from your own personal pain? You know, I think that you're hitting on something where it wasn't this, you know, white picket fence, like perfect little the Joneses kind of situation. And so I had a sister that did when I, as I was growing up, probably when I was around nine or 10, went through a lot of mental health issues and it kind of, they sprinkled kind of into her adulthood, which is into my adulthood. And I think just kind of, especially, um, you know, growing up, having that go on in the house and being, you know, in all other respects, you know, no one would have known that as showing up as a kid, always had friends, always had all the things. It actually is something that, that was incredibly humbling, but I also think it makes you think a little bit more. I don't know whether it's just, I'm already a natural thinker. And on top of that also had those conditions going on growing up. And it just was the combo that like led to the beast, <laughs> you know, meaning just led to this kind of curiosity and asking more inner questions and being more introspective. So um, absolutely. I think that was a piece of it for sure. I, I love that you brought up introspection and I'm, I, I know Tim's probably got some questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask this and then I'm going to let you answer and then I'm going to let Tim ask the next question. What do you think our biggest barrier is to introspection? Self-awareness, right? Cause if you have no self-awareness, you're not asking any questions. You're just kind of doing your, you're just doing whatever you're doing. So I think that when, you know, you hear it a lot in terms of uh, psychology or spirituality, just kind of waking up, quote unquote, right? So I think when you start just becoming more aware of why you do the things you do, why you react the ways you react, where did, where did it come from? Who around you acted that the way that maybe taught you that? It's just, it's a whole spider web and a rabbit hole of, of things that it's a, that there's so many questions once you kind of break through that barrier. Agree. Agree. Great answer. I, cool. I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. I, uh, I, and just kind of piggybacking off that, like when you start to, to uncover things and, and get some answers, I always find that it leads to more uncovering yeah. things and more questions yeah. that need answering as well. Yeah. You know, infinite. so <laughs> yes, it's a, that's what I was going to say. It's like a continuous <laughs> process. Right. Um, but what I originally had, had asked you about uh, initially about uh, talk when, I wanted to, you know, kind of have you come on and kind of talk about, um, you know, how, how we can sit with uncomfortable feelings and how to mm -hmm. kind of allow them, you know, just sit in that space and allow them to come and maybe even learning a little bit how to navigate through them. If you can kind mm -hmm. of yeah, guide absolutely. us a bit on that. I think before you can even start dissecting how to even sit with those uncomfortable feelings, you have to know how you could potentially be distracting yourself from even feeling them. So, so the first barrier is not even wanting to feel uncomfortable. So often there's a lot of, you know, coping mechanisms that we do. So we don't feel it. <laughs> it could be, you know, whether it's just ignoring or whether it's just, you know, hitting like really negative habits, anything you're doing to numb, distract, that's going to keep you from, feeling the things you don't want to feel, but it's going to create a lot of issues in your life. So I think it's first, the first tier is just getting aware of what you do to distract yourself from feeling 
the uncomfortable feelings that you don't want to feel. And then I think it, you know, when you're sitting with them, it's the practice almost of, I'm really uncomfortable. I want to grab a beer. I want to call someone I shouldn't. I want to. It's like really being aware of what you're doing and what you're trying to grab onto so you don't feel what you don't want to feel. And once you get into that space and you learn to quote unquote sit with it, which a lot of people, I get this all the time from clients, like, what do you mean sit with it? Like, <laughs> and you know, cause it's who, who, but I think what I mean by that, it's not just literally like sitting and feeling it. Well, it is, but it's okay, cool. I'm uncomfortable today. I'm going to go about my day and I'm just going to allow discomfort to be there because if I allow something to be there, it can just be felt and then it can be processed and then it can like float away. It's almost like an annoying bee that when you like swing at it and you try to make it want to go away, it just comes at you more. So I don't know, that's a little mini rundown at least about, you know, hopefully answering your question. It, it sounds to me like our reactions are are the cause of our pain often because mm -hmm. i've i equate response with a positive action where mm -hmm. reaction is from the habit is from the fear is from the doubt mm -hmm. is from the worry is that which something sometimes is, yeah which is sometimes like conditioned right you know and, and it can be super unconscious i think a lot of times that's where the self-awareness piece comes in when you initially ask me that i think we're reacting in a way we don't even know we don't even that's, know that we're yeah, yeah that's what i was going to actually that, that's what i was going to ask you next because how you brought it up with you know to pay attention to you know the ways or the habits or whatever it is and and some of those, that's what I was going to say. Some of those are unconscious and we don't even realize it. They are, but it's cool. I think what shines a little bit of a flashlight on where there's areas to look at is where you're having potential like issues in your relationships or when there's repeat offending things that are going on. And do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, wow, I keep showing up and someone keeps, you know, giving me, I keep getting this reaction. I think sometimes when something is consistent, it's something to look at, right? I don't think one person's opinion is a make or break, but I think when you keep being the common denominator and a situation keeps playing out with different people, that can be pointing to some sort of, whether it's a habit or way of reacting that's not working for you or, or just is worth some introspection. We, I, I love to talk about introspection and I'm, yeah. I'm, ge I'm getting better at it. I, cool. I always thought I was introspective, but then after I've been doing years of therapy and, and all the issues that I've had myself, I realized that my introspection probably wasn't looking at all the things that I needed to look at. What is a good question that we can ask ourselves to start that deep introspection look? Because mm -hmm. I know many of us are, I, obviously many of us are afraid of yeah. self-awareness nowadays, as you can tell. Right, We're so afraid right. to figure out that we're not everything we thought we were. We're not mm -hmm. everything. So what is a good question to start with? I guess even before it's like, cause it's not this specific question. I think it's more like if there is a lot of fear around introspection, if you're in environments where everyone in the room is also afraid of it, that's not going to help you get more comfortable with it. So sometimes I think the first thing I would point you toward is kind of going toward it right? As much as you can based on how scared of it you are, right? Because it's, it's almost like asking somebody to go, you know, surf when they can't even swim, and swim, <laughs> right? So it's like, I think that starting to just get curious about, huh, like I'm, I'm kind of curious about this thing they call introspection, but like everyone in my world, like doesn't do it and thinks it's lame. So I think it's like, maybe it's looking at a book, maybe it's, you know, starting to look at like, podcast or you know something towards mental health or because you're going to get a lot of that language and you're going to hear a lot of people in the world be talking about concepts that maybe are really foreign to you but you're going to get used to the language it's almost like learning a new language if it's not been in how you talk or how you think and so and I think once from that I think you're going to have your own questions that kind of come up whether it's the questions that you know just come up for you because of like the material you're digesting so, so, and I think everyone's different and everyone has a different starting point and it's important to honor that else you're going to either be uh, way ahead of someone or you're, you know, and miss the beat. So you really have to like honor where you're at. I agree with that. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you for uh, clarifying that because I was going to ask you a couple of questions and you, you answered them actually on the awesome. way to them. So cool. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find, 
Oh, sorry. Sensei. Sorry. Well, do you, I was just wondering if do you find um, with, you know, a, maybe like a commonality between your clients mm -hmm. as far as, you know, do you, do you think that there is, um, how do I say, more of an issue with like, you know, people um, being aware or being introspective or mm -hmm. people not knowing how to deal with uncomfortable feelings? Is there something that really stands out that you notice a lot? Like a common, just yeah. something I see in the room. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think by the time someone's already deciding and willingly coming to me, there's obviously some sort of you know, they're putting themselves in an environment where they know that's the deal, right? So okay. you tend to already get the person that's either, you know, introspective or if, if, you know, they're working on it and they're a newbie, at least they're trying. And I think, I think just being open and having a person that's open to it, now you can like fill in all the blanks. And so I think it's more about meeting someone in the room where they're at. And that's just the gauge that you're kind of, you're kind of always doing that in life with people, you know, you're just kind of like, you know, or we're not, and we're trying to push someone to be where they're not. And that's, that's a whole other issue. But I think um, in terms of doing my job, it's, it's absolutely gauging at first where that client is at and like meeting them where they're at. So I can like kind of pick them up and then take them from there. You've been serving clients now for quite a long time and you've done yeah. a lot of work. How mm -hmm. did, did you start to do work on yourself as you were developing your education, was this mm. something that you obviously you were you gravitated towards this, as you said, because, you know, you had all the clicks, you were, you know, you were curious mm. about people. So curiosity is obviously a really big thing. And I think a lot yeah. of that gets beat out of us as we get older because we become less curious and more stuck in our ways. So what is a way for us to get back to that curiosity? I mean, at 50 years old and yeah. all the, and all the hangups that I have in life, how do yeah. I get back to being curious if I'm not curious already? I'm, I happen to be very curious about yeah. all of this or else I wouldn't be sitting here. So. Yeah. I, you I know, well, I almost want to just say, you just start, right? It's just like, <laughs> you just start, you just start going toward things that you're interested in. I mean, even you guys with like starting a podcast, you just start like you are curious and here you are. So. I think it's not as complicated as we make it. And I also think it's, it, I, I think you have to check in about your belief of adulthood. Sometimes I do see people just like, well, we're adults now, you know, and it's yeah. like, what is <laughs> adulting, that? we're like, adulting. Yeah, we're adulting. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm all for like adulting and being responsible and also having that like childlike curiosity and having fun and like not putting limits on what you can't do anymore because you're an adult, you know? So I've always been like that though where I, it, you know, it's, it hasn't been hard for me to like, think I'm like, I'm just an adult and I need to, you know, like, I think that's the playfulness. I've almost struggled sometimes in a career that at first, especially 20 years ago, wasn't as, um, I feel like I found a way to do this career at this point where there's like, it's, it's truly, truly me. But at first it was very clinical and I felt like the playfulness and the adulting was so like, um, I was being called to do that more than felt natural for me. So it's been really cool coming into my own and being able to bring that like curiosity and playfulness and like lightness to a job that, you know, has a bad rap of being so heavy. That's actually, uh, you know, it kind of sparks a question for me. Yeah. Um, being in the field and, and doing this for that period of time, do you think that it's, it's evolving for the better? as far as the, the, the mental health world of, of counselors and therapy, yeah, as it, as it, is it yeah. progressing in the right you way? Know, I think that that question is going to be different based on how you do this job. And what I mean by that is I'm now working in private practice, which is extremely different and a very different job when I was working in agencies, let's say or working for a, the state or right. Like it's a, it, it was almost like two different careers. So I think that how the, the profession as a whole is progressing, I don't know because I just know my lane now of what I'm doing with my practice. And um, I'm, I'm out of that, you know, agency state job where you're, you're, you know, it's just, it's just, two different entities. So I don't even know if I can speak to that general 
population of mental health. I just know who I have in front of me and I just do my best to like help that like one person at a time or even, you know, as you found me on YouTube, trying to like get to a larger audience where it's like people can get a message that perhaps can help them and trying to figure out how to do that. I don't know. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. No, that's fair. Yeah, no, that's fair. I was just kind of curious as you were talking, it, it just kind of popped into my head and just to get your take on it. Yeah, I definitely know that I, even with like, all the things that have been happening in our world, I'll definitely, that is a very common phrase of, wow, you must be busy, right? <laughs> like just, <laughs> and so, yes, obviously I think mental health as a whole is, we're really seeing just where it's at, you know, not only in our country, but our world. And so, I, you know, the people doing the front lines of this job, it's like when the demands a lot, I can see how burnout and just making sure that you're doing all those things for yourself is so important. Speaking of that, what do you, as far as self-care and what do you engage in to kind of help you through? Yeah, so many things. So um, travel is a huge thing for me personally. I just, I love travel and, and it's to a point now where actually when I'm traveling, I'm also working remotely to some extent, um, being active has always been huge. It's like almost just like, you know, balance. I think just like taking really good care of yourself, you know, having solid relationships, doing all the hobbies and making time for all those things on the daily, because if not, it's just like, a like it's your life, like why not? And B, I think when you're doing this job and you're giving so much of yourself hour to hour, which, which, I have no problem with, but if I'm not filled up, that's, that's a lot harder. And I'm not as good as I can be to the person in front of me that's looking for help. So I don't know. I take that really seriously. And I think it's like, almost like you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of someone else in a sense. So I'm all for like, yeah, go on vacation. Like, don't do that. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not one to just like make myself miserable and work myself to death. I don't think it's, I don't think it's smart. Because there's a shortage, it seems to me that there's a shortage of therapists. And I, I, I'm i curious to know is if after all the education that you've had, mm-hmm. is the education that you're getting, does mm-hmm. it, is there a different way to go about it to, to get people that have personal experience and Mm-hmm. And different mm-hmm. and different avenues to come to it. Is there a better way to? I don't want to say fast track because mm-hmm. I think in this day and age of YouTube, everybody thinks they're an expert. And right. I I realize that the only thing I'm an expert on is nothing because right. the more I do this and the more I talk to fantastic people like yourself, I realize mm-hmm. that I could learn a lot more. Is there a better way to train professionals to get mm-hmm. them ready to handle people? So. I think that this is, this has been what's changed a lot in the mental health field. As you know, I think it's called a life coach, right? Like that's the person that to some extent, whether they did or did not, like some people, like you don't need to be licensed or go through the school in order to start a business or a private practice or whatever. You're going to start to help people. That doesn't make it right though. That doesn't make it right. But I can also say that just because you go through school and you go through all the bells and whistles doesn't mean you're great at what you do. Right. I get that. Right. I understand. So it's, I think that there could be people that I I think there definitely needs to be training and I don't, I don't even know. It's like, you know, but I, 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 I think our world is changing. Like when I went to school, it was, you go to school and that is the only way you could, you know, be a therapist or help someone in the capacity of therapy. We live in a world now where if, if someone is getting help from someone that, you know, threw up an Instagram and is saying really inspiring things and writes an amazing book and is helping. I I'm all for that. I think where I have an issue either way, sometimes I get clients going, I just went to a professional and they said this, and I've been really depressed for six months because of walking out of their office and feeling awful. Like, so I'm just kind of saying, I don't, I I'm all for education. And, and I think it's important to have a framework and have a lot of like practices and philosophies that are important to be aware of. I also think that like there, there could be a really different way to train people. So it's not so financially, you know, strapping you up and um, I don't know. So I, it, it, that would be like, there's a more interesting conversation for this, you know, for sure. Yeah. Speaking of your education and stuff, is there a particular 
like we've we've talked about DBT, we talk about CBT, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and there's ACT. There's all these different modalities, mm -hmm. so to yeah. speak. Is there something that you have used in your practice, or is it a, an overview of a lot of different things? You know what? At this point, it's really interesting because at first, I think when you first get out of school, you're very like, okay, what psychodynamic and CBT, right? But I, it's been so, not so long, but it's been so long where I've just like kind of crafted my own way of doing what I do. And sometimes when people ask me that, I notice it's a little bit of a like, wait, what, what am I doing in the room, right? Cause I'm not like, okay, right now I'm gonna use psychodynamic, right? But I think it's a mix of so many different things at this point. I mean, obviously when it comes to hearing someone's where someone's, um, you know, root issue is, it goes into pointing it out and then being like, all right, so what I want you to do is I want you to really be aware of when you go to distract yourself. So I guess that's CBT, right? So, but at this point, it's like, you know, and I think hearing some of these history and going into the psychodynamic piece of just knowing what the foundation was for someone, how, what the influences were that they were growing up with who mom and dad are, like, not that that pegs them, but it gives you context that leads to more questions that then leads you to be able to hear what their perspectives are or where their false beliefs may live. Or it's just, it's kind of like an art, honestly. I see my job for how I do it more artful than, than clinical. I don't awesome. know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally, <laughs> no, totally, totally. Yeah. I, I'm, I wanted to know, is there, is there a particular idea that brings people to you? Mm -hmm. Is it, mm -hmm. is it, do you see people like, is it that a lot of your clients come to you because they haven't had anything else work or mm -hmm. is it, do they come to you because of your videos? It, like what mm -hmm. usually, what is like one of the best, what is one of the biggest things that brings your clients to you? I think at this point, it's, it's, you know, when I started doing this, it, it's almost like it's a lot of word of mouth still. I mean, it, with all the modalities and all these mediums going on in the world, it comes down to someone close to you had a good experience and they're going to, especially when it comes to like something so personal, I think a lot of people still feel really safe when their best friend or their cousin or someone that they know really well and respect gives them the referral. Um, I also, you know, I guess the biggest thing, and I think, you know, take away all the degrees or all the, all the fancy stuff. It's how someone just feels with you in a room. That's it. Like that is all. And I think if you are really listening to someone and you really care and you're like hearing them in the room, that's doing 75% of your job right there. Yeah. That's, that was a quote I heard and I forget who I heard it from, but the biggest collateral that we have now is how we make people feel. 100%. But that's true. That's always been true, right? Like, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. Personal yeah. relationships. Right. It's just like when you don't feel good around someone or you don't feel like someone's listening to you, it's like, you're, I'm out, you know? Like, so I think it's, it's interesting. I, it's interesting getting clients that have not felt heard at all in the room because someone is so into the checklist or the questions and they're they're missing the human in front of them. That's been interesting feedback. That's actually one thing I wanted to just kind of go back on to where, when you were talking about working with your clients. Something that I appreciate and I love to hear is that it sounds to me like you really work with the individual as an individual, which yeah. I think is huge. I think that yeah. is what is missing. And I think that's what we need to continue to do. Because as you said, if we're going by a checklist, it's this isn't like a one size fits yeah. all type thing, you know, and yeah. learning about the person learning about their background. And, and as you say, the foundation, you're able to kind of get a reference point on where they're coming from, and, you know, can dig in a little bit deeper. And, you know, that's to me, I think that's where it's at. Then from that, you can kind of go, if you feel you need to take it more of a, you know, CBT route, you can go that route, more of a psychotherapy mm -hmm. route. You can go, however you, you know, and I think that's, I think that's key. So 
that's a that I just wanted yeah. to kind of point that out. That's very cool. Yeah, I think even the struggle for me earlier on when you when there is this system of how you do this job and when you have a first client, here's the paperwork and here's what you do in the room. I think it was really, really hard for me always to have a clipboard in front of me. It's like there's a human being in front of me. I don't know them. They don't know me. We're sitting in this like stale room with like blinkety like lights that are like blinking and fluorescent. And I'm sitting here with like a clipboard and a pen. This is weird. Like, so I remember as like fast as I can ditch that thing I ditched it and it's just like you know you do what you need to do for like the paperwork <laughs> but then it's like let's not forget why we're really here and I think that there's certain you know going back to your question Will a little earlier of like there's certain jobs where it's like but you really need the paperwork because the paperwork is what does the billing and the the insurance needs it and that was always really a struggle for me which is one of the reasons why i really went into my own private practice where i can do it my way and not have to feel the pressure of the papers and you know <laughs> all of that stuff when i have a human being in front of me that i want to feel you know important and like just i'm giving my energy to them not a paper i I wanted to know as as someone who has been a therapist now for quite some time do you do you notice that it's more our childhood that that creates the issues that we have or is it or is it something in adulthood is have you noticed a divide between what we've brought in as children as mm -hmm. in in growing up or is there a, a, a distinct line where you know that this is not mm -hmm. their childhood, this is just them now? Mm -hmm. is, is that a clear, yeah. is, and I don't even know if that's a clear question to you. No, I got you, I got you. So I think that, you know, that's why the initial question for me is, what brings you here, right? Like, why, why are you coming in here today? And a lot of the times with that question, I can, you know, you start unpacking, okay, I can see that like their situation that they're in here for today does, does stem from childhood for them. And I think sometimes someone's coming in and it's a issue that truly is just kind of, um, it's current and, you know, everybody doesn't, you know, no one gets through childhood unscathed, right. To some extent, but I think that the degree of severity of hurt and pain is what's, is what I'm always, you know, that's my job to assess that. And I think usually based on the presenting issue, you start kind of seeing it pretty quickly in the room based on just like the questions and kind of where things like when was the last that time did that happen or like hey how was this growing up and you start kind of seeing it so I think it's an individual thing but it's my job to kind of decode is this just something that we can kind of do some CBT stuff and like it's situational and it's just kind of a, a product of where they are or is this like more deep-seated and we need to do more root work yeah that's cool I, I uh I tend to agree with exactly what you're saying I think as you're saying, like some people are just more susceptible based on their childhood to mm -hmm. illness or to whatever, you know, mm -hmm. overcoming certain obstacles. Yeah. And then there's there's events that come up that can totally shatter someone's world and 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 they're in their trauma and they've never been in trauma and, and even more. Right. So it's like it's so individual. I like can't say that enough. Right. So there's a lot of it's so hard to, to answer any specific question and give a generalization. And I think it's also my personality where I've always been like, oh, I'm not generalizing, <laughs> right? But I think it's just really looking at the person in front of you and trying to see them clearly. And I think that's what generalizations does or stereotypes, right? It makes you just not see what's going on. It's easy to like get blinded by that. You inspired you inspired a question just now cool. because I'm curious, like, and I keep saying this, I got to cut this out. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, I, I want to know what you think, where, do, where is it trauma versus grief? And do we know the difference? And can you know the difference? It's like when you when you initially say that, I just like see a layered cake and it's like Yeah, I, I liken it to taco. I liken it to taco dip myself. Yeah, taco dip. Taco dip. We got the with the refried beans are at the Absolutely, bottom, right? yeah. Yeah. So that's like trauma to me. And then I think I think a symptom of trauma is grief. Right. So Okay, like, yeah. Like it almost feels like trauma is this thing. And then there's all these symptoms and reactions and behaviors and habits 
that get formulated based on a specific trauma. But I think okay. grief is now there's a grief process, right? For everything that, you know, we have pain around or loss around. That's a whole different kind of beast. Do you think that like un, unacknowledged or untreated grief can become a trauma? I think anything's possible, <laughs> right? Like I think that it depends on, so what's that person doing because they're grieving? What, what are they, what kind of habits are they forming? What kind of relationships are they starting to partner in that can cause to a traumatic relationship? Absolutely. To actually, now that I'm talking it through, it's like, yes, potentially, okay. right? Because yeah. I, think it, every, I think everything does start with an emotion that we don't digest very well. And we start kind of navigating based on that emotion, not sitting right. And we start making choices that are not for us. So do you think, I don't know, this may be different because you just said you, you think it starts with an emotion. Do you think it starts with an emotion or a thought? What do you feel is first? Trauma? Or just in general, any any kind of, yeah, I mean, trauma, but in, in general, like, do, do you think that the emotion will come before the thought or the thought comes before the emotion I don't know I'd have to think about that a part of me wants to be like chicken or the egg like I don't know right like <laughs> okay I mean I guess it would be thought right because you have to have a thought before you have like an emotion I don't know but I'm, I'm kind of just like freestyling right now on just no like that's the, okay you know, we're not holding you to this don't worry yeah no 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 I kind of <laughs> like it but like it's it's an interesting I mean I, I guess initially I would I would it's like you have a thought before you can have an emotion right that's just that's my gut of- no, that's kind of mine too. But the way you described it just now, I'm like, maybe an emotion can pop up quick. And then that thought might yeah. be like quickly right after it. Maybe they're mm-hmm. connected some mm-hmm. way. And maybe it's actually the emotion that comes mm-hmm. first and we just don't realize it. I don't know. I think that our bodies can absolutely, like sometimes we don't even realize that something's wrong until like our bodies are right. So, I mean, you're kind of getting into this interesting conversation where it's like, you know, not even knowing something's wrong until something physical starts happening. So you don't even realize it, but your, your emotions are being stored within your body. So, you know, the more and the more body keeps the score. It, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Boom. I mean, one of the best, one of the greatest books ever written as yeah, far as like, from my standpoint, just because yeah. it's like, it really does. And I, and I've noticed this from my own work that I really do hold a lot in my body. And I, and I've said Mm -hmm. this to Tim before that, like when I start to feel things, like I can literally feel my shoulders, like start to raise up and, and all these things. Is that a re is that a response to, is that a response to trauma? Is that a habit? Is there a difference? You mean our bodies physically have yes. physiological yeah. symptoms? Yeah, Physi- physiological physiological symptoms. Is is it a is it is it a response from your body? Is it or is it an unconscious response mm-hmm. or is it an actual habit that you may have that you may have de- mm-hmm. developed over the years that you don't even know you've developed? I think it can be all of e all of the above, right? And depending on who you are. I think you could be incredibly aware of when you're really stressed and you fill it in, you know, your traps are like you, I, th- I think that it could be unconscious. I think it could be for everybody. It can be something different, but I think the, the root issue is like emotions and our, our mental health is absolutely connected to our body in, in, in the way I believe and think and practice. I mean, I'm not saying anything. It's like truth for the, you know, but this is the way I see it and how I'll say, I'll say it's true. Yeah. How about that? I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I yeah, yeah. there's no, there's no way around it. Cause it's kind of like what, you, you know, we've, we've really just said is, you know, emotions, whether they're trapped or they're lingering it, mm-hmm. at some point, some kind of psychological Mm-hmm. is going to turn into a physiological right it's like a consequence and, like everything has a consequence right and ab- i think that absolutely anything that wasn't dealt with is going to somehow have to come out and whether that's in a reaction or whether that's via your body and that's where absolutely. that mind body connection is such a huge concept and why i even you know it's really interesting even with my clients it's amazing how many people come in And, you know, they need help on this certain issue. But what's really interesting is how much the the basics, if the basics, if someone is not doing the basics, just like sleeping enough, like eating right, like, you know, exercising, just those kind of things. It's amazing how many people are not doing those things, but just kind of want to fix the problem. 
<laughs> and it's like, wait, but you've got to like get the well-oiled machine functioning. And it's so, I mean, Hey, I want to save a lot of people a lot of money right now. It's just like do your basics and take a minute and see how something pans out. And when you get that well oiled, some things might kind of loosen up or you're going to at least get the clarity to be able to handle the problem or the issue or whatever it is with more clarity and with more insight. So, and I'm not taking away from anyone's issues, but I just, I, I can't say enough how important those basics is it's like so boring to talk about because it's like everything you learned in kindergarten but it's so huge no I, we I, talk we talk about it quite often actually so yeah, it's yeah. definitely i i just wanted to ask this because you've inspired this you look like you're in very good shape yourself Thank you. and i'm wondering is there a particular places you've noticed in your clients that people tend to hold things emotions more in than others oh, is, is cool it the question. neck yeah. is it the shoulder mm -hmm. like because mm -hmm. i know for myself personally i've had um physical trauma like i've had my neck fixed mm -hmm. i have i'm fused from c4 to c7 Mm -hmm. um, and I know this, that I hold a lot of emotion in my, mm -hmm. in this upper area. Yeah. Is there, is there a body part or particular area that people tend to hold emotion in more than others? Mm -hmm. What I can say that I've witnessed is obviously there's different emotions that are correlated with different parts of the body where you, you know, where you hold emotion and for specific reason, based on your individual experience or your trauma or what's not healed. What I have seen that's been really interesting with people who are, let's say communication or speaking up, literally speaking up is an issue for them. When they come in initially, I kind of notice that they're like talking from like their throat. Like I can notice it's like a, a meek, it, like they're not talking kind of from their, their core of who they are. They're talking kind of from their, their throat. So it's interesting kind of working with how someone's presenting and where I literally kind of see or, or kind of hear them even talking from. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it totally does. I as mm -hmm. I've been singing for many years, and what I what I never put together was until much later, in, in the last probably fifteen years, as I've been doing a lot of the personal work, um, is that what we breathe, how we breathe in meditation, belly breathing, is actually how you breathe singing wise, because it's all diaphragmatic mm -hmm. breathing. Mm -hmm. So I I totally understand where you're coming from, and I totally understand those feelings because mm -hmm. I know that there's there are certain there are certain events that I still hold emotion to that I know mm -hmm. feel I can feel close me off yeah. and I can mm -hmm. feel it in certain areas even mm -hmm. though they've gotten better but I can still feel it mm -hmm. and is there a time when we realize that we've processed an emotion it, do we feel lighter mm -hmm. is that a legitimate mm -hmm. thing or is it more psychosomatic mm -hmm. I think, again, I think it's going to be really individual for everybody. Like, you know, someone could have had a bad back for, you know, six months and then all of a sudden, like it, like it just goes away and for no apparent reason and they did nothing to like make it better. But, you know, so I, I do feel that um, it's, it's such an individual thing. Yeah, I kind of lost the um, yeah. kind of lost <laughs> no, the question. No, it's, it's, <laughs> I was like, what no, are you saying? That's that's <laughs> that's what the question will. That's why we edit things. <laughs> we okay, edit cool. things and condense them a little bit more, okay. so it sounds like we've put it all together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I lost the question on that one. It sounds like it sounds like we're good at what we do. That's all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I guess we're getting more to the psychosomatic part of it and how we hold it, in which our is so and cool stuff. and so huge. It's it's so cool and so huge and i think that it's it's also asking a person to have pretty good body mind awareness right like to even know like it's amazing just when you're really disconnected with your body you don't even realize how how much certain areas can be hurting there's like a disconnect sometimes that could be happening that we have no awareness around i think again it, i hear myself keep talking about awareness 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 right and well, it's, it's, huge. It. it's, yeah, it's it huge it's huge because mm -hmm. I, I i've said this to tim before that i don't think that you can do anything about anything unless you're aware of it True. but now obviously we can't if we choose to ignore it then that's our choice and mm -hmm. and we're dealt with the circumstances right absolutely yeah definitely i think i think awareness is the uh the starting point for for all of it you mm -hmm. know 
If you're not mm-hmm. aware, you don't know. Number one, you don't know what you're looking for. You don't know where you're looking. You know, if you right. can learn to kind of assess the, your body and go through like a body scan and say, oh, geez, mm-hmm. I'm feeling, you know, kind of stressful in my arms or my neck mm-hmm. or my legs, whatever it may be. And then you can kind of zero in on it and, and hopefully, you know, maybe connect some dots as to what mm-hmm. it what it is that's happening. Well, actually, I kind of wanted yeah. to connect those dots and I didn't mean to cut you off, Kim. I yeah. know, just Tim kind of inspired his question. Yeah, please. Is it, do you have a particular practice that gets you into your body, be it oh, yoga, gosh. be it Qigong, yeah. be it like yeah. meditation? Be it well, anything? now you're, yeah, you're hitting on something. I mean, so I've, I've been an athlete pretty much all, you know, up and, and I still try to like really kick my own butt. <laughs> but I, I think that whether it's, a physical practice that you have or a sport. I, I even think that is going to put you in more connection with your body. Cause you kind of have to be, or, or just by practice, you're practicing, like being more connected. Is it, po- <laughs> is it possible though? Because yeah. you kind of struck on something interesting. Is yeah. it possible to be into your body and still not have that mind connection? Absolutely. I think, I, like I said, I think anything's possible given who we're talking about. Right. And I think that because of certain reasons or even traumas, something could be totally disconnected within our bodies that we're not even aware of. Right. It's almost like, I mean, you hear this almost with like horrible things like sexual assault in in younger years. And it's like something, someone doesn't understand certain symptoms that they're having. And it's an unconscious thing that was, you know, stored in their body. It's kind of coming out in their adulthood. So I do think that absolutely that's a thing. Cause I I asked that because you see so many, like, I, I want to take like athletes like, you know, mm-hmm. like a Tiger Woods or like a Tony Hawk or or a Venus Williams who seem to put all of the game together at the mm-hmm. utmost of, you know, whatever their sport is. Mm-hmm. Is it possible that that's habitual, that they've just mm-hmm. practiced so much that it just becomes yeah. second nature? Or mm-hmm. is there does there always have – because I would think that a lot of – especially solo sports – you would mm-hmm. think would have to have a little bit more mind connection because you'd mm-hmm. have to be a little bit more available because it's just you that has to perform. Mm-hmm. But is that, can that be hab- so habitual that you've practiced so much that you can just go through the motions and still be that great? Or do you think that there has to be another factor that plays into that? I mean, that's a tricky question, right? There's so many components going on in that. And, and I also think that, you know, to some degree, there's there's natural ability that some people just have more so than the average person. And then I think you're talking about professionals who all they do all day long is practice that connection. So anything you do a lot or you're spending a lot of time doing, you're going to get better at just based on time and energy output. But I do think that there's, you know, we, we all grew up with it. There's just certain kids. It's even like whether you're just really good at science. You're really good at sports. You're, you, you were the athletic one or you were the smart one. Or I think we all have our strengths. And I think some people's strength is just they're naturally kind of more connected to their physicality. And, and I don't know how that, that's kind of interesting how that can correlate into, I think you have to keep up that practice, right? I think you could be an athlete when you're 25 and all of a sudden you're 45 and you don't do anything for yourself anymore and your body's, you disconnected the body mind. And so, you know, I think no matter what you have to upkeep anything, right? Anything needs to be, you have to eat well. You don't just eat well for two weeks and then think you're going to be in shape, right? It's like, right. It's like going to the gym and lifting. It's like going to the gym and lifting once a month. And yeah, and being like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be good. (laughs) It's it's like, it's like, it's like healing. It's like healing and growth and growth. You can't just, you can't just take a pill and and expect to get better. You can't just, you know, do a Reiki like one week and go, oh, I'm better. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a process. And I think yeah. it's also variables. There's, you know, you could take medication, and you can exercise and you can work yeah. on your thought process. Yeah. And you can do other, you know, holistic things. But I, I yeah. think the more you do and combine together, yeah. the, the better off you will be. That's I my you, personal thing. I well, I think you just nailed something where it's up to everybody uniquely to figure out and decode Absolutely. what their formula is. And then the thing is that formula can change as we change and our bodies change. So I think that's actually almost Will's answer too, right? Is it's just always trying to figure out like what is 
what are the things that I need to do for this phase of life, given like where I'm at, where my body's at, where, what I need and what's going on around me to keep yes. me like operating at the best I know how. And I think that does shift even for the yeah. athlete or the Tiger Woods or the this or that. It's just, it's a lifetime. So right. it's going to ebb and flow. I like the the flashlight analogy too. putting the flashlight yeah. on mental health. I think that yeah. kind of helps people uh, visualize it a little bit better. Yeah, for sure. Kim, I'm trying to be very cognizant of your time and we so appreciate you being here and everything, man. It's been an amazing meeting you, uh, meeting you Zoom wise, meeting you email wise. Yeah, it's same, been awesome. Your same. energy, your energy is incredible. I've watched a bunch yeah. of your, I've, I've watched some of your Instagram videos that you've posted and, and I know that you love travel because I've seen some of your Instagram posts of you and yeah. the hiking and different things. Yeah, I'm trying to kind of, you know, stick that initial topic when you guys were talking about just like difficult emotions um and i'm trying to kind of see if there's anything else just to like help someone through that i think i think just to kind of sum that up a little bit more is i think it's hard for some people to even just sit with themselves and be alone for a day with with their own self and what i've been noticing lately that's a theme is just seeing a lot of people have problems that a lot of it is stemming from needing to to put more energy into the relationship between them and them it's like until you really get that relationship with yourself pretty dialed i mean it's like and, and again that's always maintenance i think that sitting with anything is going to be extremely uncomfortable i think when you have that foundation of really having a good relationship with yourself and knowing all the things you need to do to keep that connected you're more apt to be able to just handle anything, including things like difficult emotions. So if that seems really scary, and if you're a person who's just avoiding, 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 I would, it, before we even get to sitting with something that's totally uncomfortable and you, you're not going to face because it's too big, I would bring you more toward looking at the relationship with yourself and doing some introspection on, you know, how are your boundaries? How do you allow people to treat you? what's even your wording and and what do you allow when you don't really even does like what do you invite into your life when you don't even really want it because you know you think you should or you're people pleasing or so i would just kind of point you toward that relationship because i think you're going to need that pretty solid to deal with hard emotions because that's that's tricky that's that's hard for any but that's hard for the most evolved person to deal with so maybe just break it, breaking it down a little bit more for everybody to be able to like, look at that relationship with their own self and, and just giving that a little look over. Wow. To wow. me, it all comes back to self love. Like we've, we've talked about yeah. this many I'll times. Start, I'll really start with you. Yeah, really I'll start with you. I, mm -hmm. I just want to, I, I'd like it, it. I just felt like this light flash down, um, you know, when you said it's, I don't know verbatim, but it's almost like different when for healthy people, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so if you work more towards being healthy, then yes. some of this other stuff is going yes. to be. That's what I almost say with the basics too, right? It's like, just do your basics and you, you are, you might be surprised what happens and what evolves with your body and your mind when you just like feed yourself, right? Exercise enough, sleep enough, just basics. You heard it here, people. Basics. <laughs> Get back to the basics. Basics. Back guys. to the basics. <laughs> back, I, back to the basics. Back to the basics. Back to the basics. Well, Kim, thank, thank you, you so guys. much for being here. Absolutely. Um, we finish every podcast with three questions. And okay. I'm going to let Tim start firing away. Here we go. Kim, do you have a favorite or a least favorite word? You know what's a weird word? I don't know why this just came to my mind, but I think it's interesting, like the elderly. Like that's such a like interesting word to call. Like I don't know. It's just like it, it has a flair to it. Something's <laughs> funny about that word to me. I don't know why. Wait a second. I'm pushing that. The step. elderly. <laughs> I don't know. It's now. just an interesting. That's fair. Yeah. In mind. yeah. Don't know why that's yeah. it. My question to you is because you're a therapist and you have all these things going on, where does jewelry play into your creativity and is that creativity part of your mental health wellness practice absolutely i mean it's not to answer it too lengthily but that's been a whole journey of just i started designing t-shirts but went into photography that kind of molded into jewelry and now they're all you know at one point i was kind of having businesses and all 
three avenues. And I feel like in a way for how I want to do my practice, all that creativity, like my whole practice is kind of, it's me. Right. So I think just a facet of it, um, even like the travel, everything, it's just like, that's all my babies. I kind of put into one. And because of all those things, I show up, how I show up. So, you know, at first I understand how they completely don't align to a lot of people, but in a way also too, stones have energies and, you know, are from the earth and are just the, a lot of my jewelry pieces incorporate natural stones. And, and to me, you know, there's just that spiritual connection there. So in my head, it totally branches, but I know at first when I, you know, decided to put my jewelry shop on my website, a lot of people were like, what did we get jewelry? And you're like, wait, you're what? Like, it's been more interesting at this point. Now I think it's more funny watching some people just kind of not understand, but I'm, I'm owning it now. So I'm good with it. <laughs> well, they, I mean, they talk about multiple streams of income. So, but I, yeah, I do, yeah. I totally understand as I, yeah. Tim and I have been involved in our music scene here in the 518 for many years. Yeah. And I understand where, you know, a lot of these, these, these separate entities, these tentacles of your creative process never seem to come together, but in reality, they all come together because for me, like podcasting and, and playing music and, and sharing yeah. music and just all those things are all the same thing. They just yeah. happen to be branches of the same tree. It's right. just that we've separated so many things. I think often that we, we lose sight that they're all just part of us. It's funny that you said it. Cause I got a lot of pressure of just do one. Like you just, you need to do just one. And I remember like trying to go with that in certain times of my life and it just feeling so boring. I well, how do you, how do you me. manage that? How do you manage that though? Do you have a specific, mm -hmm. do you have a specific time when you create your jewelry? Because obviously your, your therapy practice, I would, I, I, I'm just assuming this and mm -hmm. I don't know this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would assume that's your main your main, yeah. your main job. And then yeah. the jewelry and the other stuff is just extensions of who you are. Absolutely. I think there was a point of time where, you know, that became incredibly clear when, you know, even jewelry design is a full-time job as well. So I think I, what I got clear on is you can't do three things and do them all really well. And for how I want to operate, I want to, I want to do what I'm doing really well. So it, it became clear where those other things kind of needed to be put and just with how things evolved and um, just, it, it became clear that for right now, jewelry gets this much energy and it's just, it keeps it fun and it keeps it not stressful. And then it's able to add in addition to my therapy website. And then I get to play around with, I have a whole group of girlfriends that are all photographers. So we get to do product shots and then go on. So it kind of all like, has evolved without me planning it, but it just really, I'm really happy with like how it all fits together at this point. Awesome. That is so cool. I, I congratulations and the best of the most energy that I can send to you. That is so cool. Cause that is oh, like, you. it is one of the, like, I, I struggle with a lot of those things cause I'm still struggling mm -hmm. with how do I put all these things that I'm interested in together to to do I didn't it's know until it kind of just was like one day I, I just so glad what if I can say anything I'm so glad I held tight to like what felt true to me and I didn't listen to people telling me I just need to do one because it's like doesn't make sense to do this and randomly and it took a decade but it was like oh I get why I like took photography classes and like shot some weddings and did a bunch of jewelry and met all these girls and now I have this therapy site and all my girlfriends do my all my pictures like it all came together and I had no clue why I was doing what I was doing but it's just like you have to hold tight right that's so common in life to just like you know I don't really know what, why and how but I'm I'm holding true to something that feels right for me and you know sometimes that can get challenging we're getting outside feedback to do something different that's an important thing is, uh, you know, being, you know, I guess, authentic to yourself and uh, it's huge. Yeah. Doing what and, you know, another thing that I do want to just point out that is huge. I've said before and I feel like it doesn't get enough of the spotlight, but um, time management is mm -hmm. is very big in your wellness, you know, and if you're because, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds like you're telling us this and it sounds to both Will and I, I, you know, I think Will would agree. It just sounds like a lot. It's like you're doing all these things, but if you're able to manage your time wisely and like you said this gets this much this gets this much and if you're yeah. able to bounce then 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 go for it then do it i think it's great yeah. but it you know some people can't and that's okay too but yeah. you know 
I think it's, I just think it's something that we should talk about a little bit more is the time management of things. Yeah. Is it about knowing your limitations too? Is it about, is that's about self-awareness, right? I think so. I mean, but it's also being willing to like say no and not, you know, if you're, if you're a people pleaser and you know, you got to get stuff done and your friends asking you to go to so-and-so like I've gotten to a point where it's like, I know what I need to do to show up the way I want to show up. And there are some compromises I have to make for that. It's worth it for me to feel good and honor myself, you know, but yeah, I think time management, I think that's, it's huge. And I also think you can learn how to be better at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we, I think we can learn how to be better at most things for sure. If there was something that you could do or that you would like to see done for mental health as a whole, without any kind Mm -hmm. of restraint, what would it be? That's a big question with, with, you know, but I, I, what's coming up for me is just like something where like people can be heard. Like, I, I don't know, even know what that means. Right. Cause I don't have any answer for That's a huge question to me. It's super vast, but something where people feel that it's just an easier way for them to feel heard and to just get the support that they're, that they need. You know, for, I, I feel like I see a lot of people just like having such a struggle trying to find the person that just can like hear them and what can we, and, and I think it's happening, right? There's things like all these platforms where, you know, therapist finders. And I, I think it's kind of happening more in our world or like apps where people can just like text a question or just, I don't think it needs to be some t- sometimes people don't need this like crazy months of therapy, like just maybe a place where it's easier for people to just feel heard. And again, like, you know, even this is kind of going to the question that you asked initially of like where mental health is going. I do think the cool thing I do see is these innovative ways for people to easily get some support. And I'm all for that. Like, I think it's really cool. I think some people like even just getting the ability to text a professional or do this or that and just get some feedback. Sometimes people are just, they just need that. So yeah, any, any sort of system that we can develop where it's just easier for that individual, for us as humans to just feel heard. Kim, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for giving of your time to us this evening. It's, it's been incredible meeting you. Can you tell our listeners where we can find you, um, mm-hmm. where we can find your jewelry, your blog, your, yeah. your blog, your, your YouTube yeah. videos, let them know where you're at. And I'm going to share all this in the show notes anyway. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So mainly you can go to my website, which is just Kim Um, and that's going to kind of be a hub to lead to all the other things. My Instagram is I am Kim Eagle. And let's see what else we got there. And then, yeah, I have a YouTube channel. So you can just probably type in the search of Kim Eagle. And I appreciate you guys. This is fun. And it was cool meeting you and the questions. It's always fun to just have these conversations. Until next week, man, get well. Be safe. Stay above. Thank you for giving us a listen. New episodes every Wednesday. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, you can share, rate, review, and even subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. Other ways to support the show? Follow us on social media. Share the content. Share our episodes. You can also buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash above ground pod. For further concerns, show ideas, or just to say hi, you can email us at above ground podcast at gmail. Once again, thank you for listening and supporting mental health. Keep the conversation going and stay above.